coordinates. So welcome to Nature's Classroom Science in the School Grounds, an online CPD for teachers training um, to use the outside classroom. Um, we are three today, we're expecting a couple more, but many more people will be watching this um, on Zoom catch up. Okay, so let's, if I can share the screen first of all. Right, South Downs Education Network. The training session has been developed um, through the South Downs Education Network. My organization, Enriching Environmental Encounters, it has, is only one organization in the network. There's over 100 education sites, centers and practitioners based in and around the National Park that deliver activities for schools and other groups to help them better understand the special qualities of this protected landscape, which we all enjoy. The South Downs National Park can provide the setting or context for locally relevant curriculum for your school members. Members of our South Downs Education Network offer a range of trips, outreach sessions, uh, where we can come into school to teach groups, online lessons and downloadable teaching resources. Please consider getting in touch as part of your planning to let us support you as much as possible, especially in this uh, COVID time and in January to March next year. We appreciate for, for most of you that trips to the National Park aren't going to take place on a weekly basis, but by taking part in today's training, you're, you're helping to build learning outside the classroom into your school's curriculum and affording the associated benefits to pupils and staff. We believe that understanding more about the National Park from nature to recreation to jobs is an important part of young people's development as they will be part of the landscape, not just while in school, but for the rest of their lives. You can visit, you can find a listing of all the education centres and providers in the network section uh, on the South Downs National Park website. And there are also links to teaching resources, grants for schools, for example, the travel grant, which allows schools who have over 10% pupils eligible for free school meals to claim back travel costs up to £300 when visiting the site or centre in the National Park. Uh, that will be modified while we can't get out of schools, uh, the, um, the specialists will come to you. And I hope you use that, particularly, as I said, in the winter um, for modelling sessions, uh, which you can then lead in the spring and summer next year. Um, it's also worth checking in with your local, ed, local authority outdoor education advisor. They offer education, now visit coordinator training and a range of help and guidance when it comes to the practical matters around planning trips, including health and safety considerations and compliance. There's a few useful um, emails there. And again, they'll be available to you if you get in touch with me. If you don't have time to take them down now, I can copy them. So today, uh, Nature's Classroom. My background is teaching in secondary and primary. Um, but for the last 12 years, I've been working in the outdoor arena. Voluntary through RSPB, Wildlife Explorers, Brighton and Hove particularly, um, church groups, Sussex Wildlife Trust, but also staff positions for a Christian conservation charity called Arosha UK, where I worked in West London for eight years, three months as education officer and education, London education manager when I left uh, last year. This is where I honed these ideas in school orchards, country parks, a community garden, including insects and staff from three different schools, not of course online, but outdoors. Um, these activities are an amalgam of all these organisations, including Forest Schools, where I'm a practitioner, level three, and I've studied education, as you probably have yourselves, the postgraduate level, but also I've done biodiversity to postgraduate level two. So let's have a look. Okay, so... Um, if you don't mind, I uh, can't see anybody else queuing up, I'm sorry to say, but if you don't mind just introducing yourself, and then we will get on with the starters, Key Stage 2, Key Stage 1. I think you're both interested in the whole school curriculum, yeah? Yep. 
Well, who wants to go first? Then? I'll go first. Okay. You can. You always do. I'm so glad you two know each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Becca. I'm Robin. I'm in oh. year four at Woodley. Um, what um, motivates me about outdoor learning is just how engaged the children are, especially um, perhaps some of the more active boys who wouldn't be as engaged um, in, in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and a difficulty that I probably still need to work on sometimes is um, getting them focused on what we should be doing rather than being overly excited about being outside. <laughs> Thank you. Rebecca, I'm at Bitterworth, year four, five. Um, what most reason me, I quite like being outside myself. So I just think that they can learn, lo lots of them, I think learn a lot more being outside because they find it that much more interesting. But again, probably the same as Robin, keeping them on topic, on task, sorry. It's just a lot, it's perhaps a little bit more planning, a little bit more behavior management because you get those few that mess around, but then I suppose it's just having strict rules. But yeah, so there's a similar reason for that, but I just, I think outside's great, much better than inside. Good. Yeah. Okay, so the benefits, I think you're both aware of the benefits to children, their physical and mental health. Um, maybe the academic side, if you're looking at assessment, it may not be quite so well understood. I have two websites um, that show children are content and their attendance has improved um, after doing that, so outside education. Um, one of them in particular from the Bay Trust um, have actually measured the effectiveness in terms of um, academia. So that one also I will give you a copy of. Um, it actually states that the, link, link, the links in the research um, improves academic performance. Um, I did get from Isabel Tree's book, I don't know if you read it, Rewilding, that nature benefits from also from children being um, engaged and enfranchised to look after it. In the previous generation, it was about 40% of the children. In this generation, it's about 10%. So while that's a little bit disheartening, I think the, the current trend, COVID is like unknown yet, but the current trend is that that 10% is rising and people are going back to outside education. So I thought I would start with a few fun uh, little, little starters. This is more to get children in the urban area, but also those rural children that don't have much um, um, experience of it for them to also uh, engage with the outdoor world. What I don't have is a, an idea of what your school grounds are like. Um, I think that's up to you. If it's good for habitats and species, then you'll probably be fine. But if you think that you need a wee bit of input to that, I know there's some really good um, sessions recorded from um, these groups like the Wildlife Trust and various others who, who are looking at um, practical things you can do in the school grounds like plant hedgerows, etc. For starters then, I'm um, going to give you a few you may have heard of some, uh, let me know. Um, we'll have a little chat after each, after each session of brother. The starters, one of them is a rainbow chip where you give each child, I uh, just happen to pick a color, it's not a very good one, I'll pick another one. Yeah, you just pick a little color, color rainbow chip out. Uh, I don't know if you can see that. And then you match it with a color in nature. Now this will only take a few seconds. They will quickly say matched and you go, yeah, that's a good match. Vanessa, whatever her name is and then they come back and they change it. This is very, very fast. If these little rainbow chips are too small for you, I would suggest then that you could then use a palette from some of the well-known um, shops you can get from Crown and Dulux. Cut them up, they work just as well. I personally like the rainbow chips, but I don't want it to be a choking hazard with key stage one children. I would probably advise them not to put them in their mouths to start with that would be a risk assessed thing and it would probably um, remind them not to do it, I hope. Second thing you can do then is take photographs. You can use real cameras, of course, but a very simple way to do it is to have a little frame like this and they, in twos probably, they, or even ones, they can go off and they can hang it over something. 
Um, they could be, it could be just a beautiful flower, bud layer, something like that. Could be a view, could be a person, um, but that's something that, that in nature, um, very often it'll be in the natural world, not a person that they could take a little photograph. Now, when you've made this very simple frame, you can keep the cardboard to the inside for drawing and sketching, which we'll come on to later. Another one, you could blindfold them. They love being blindfolded, children. Um, as long as it's safe, there's no tree roots. They have to have a person to lead them. Um, that person will take them blindfolded um, up to maybe a beautiful tree bark or something and then remove the blindfold and then put it back on and bring them back again. You don't even need to have a blindfold. If they can shut their eyes, a person could have um, their hands on the shoulders of the person in front. The person in front is the camera. The hands are the shutter. So whenever you come down your hands, they open their eyes and you, then you shut the shutter again. And that is their particular take. Could be in a sensory garden. It could be um, jasmine or in bloom or something like that, if it's spring, of course. One that takes a bit longer. I don't know if you've heard of any of these. I, I call it a little smorgasbord. It's an egg egg box. Have you heard an of egg. that? Yeah, we did it. Good. It is a good one. It could be a palette. You could have six colors in here. Uh, if it's autumn, obviously different colors from spring. But it also, it could be used for alliteration. These all happen to be S's. This is a classic one. It's not actually mine. I got it from the RSPB uh, youth leader training years ago. But I've never, um, I've never come away from it because they're so involved. And they love to bring you things back like a, 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 an empty sheet, snail shell. So smooth and everything. There's one for their choice at the end, I usually, because I've got sticky, squishy, um, scratchy, spiky, and then one of their choice at the end. Probably the funniest thing I've ever experienced is when somebody actually brought a slow worm back. Um, it wasn't alive. Uh, we did work out that we thought a cat had got it, but now I would say to them something like, no snakes or slow worms, you know, because chances of getting a live one are pretty slim, but um, they are better, better at this than we are. So that's a really good starter. Okay. Sounds like you've heard of that one, Rebecca, yeah? Okay. Yeah, we, we both did it. Oh, really. well, you did it. Oh, so it's well known. I've forgotten the person that um, pioneered this, but um, definitely into experimental, uh, experiential rather, um, nature learning. Okay. Let me get my view properly because I just seem to be stuck in one view at the moment. Right, if that's okay, we'll go into... Um, Key, part one, which is key stage two. I thought I'd start with key stage two because when we had six people coming here, um, most of them were from that key stage. Some of it, um, some of it's replicated in key stage one anyway, but I'll let you know about that when we get to year two. Rocks, fossils, and soil. So year three. After you define rocks, fossils, and soil, um, the class is divided into two. I don't know about you, but I love the idea of a carousel. You've got 30 children. I spend most of the time dividing them into two groups of 15. Seems a bit easier to handle. Usually there's one teacher, one TA. So one adult for both. Um, group one surveys. Stick with this. It's a, a cubit of soil for invertebrates. Now, basically... What that means is you have to go out with a spade and find a piece of green grass somewhere um, that the site manager is okay for you to cut a big cube out of it. I would keep it in its place, but I would release it all before the children come so you're not digging in front of them. Then what they have to do is they have to um, do a survey of what they find, mostly worms, but there might be a few ants and, well, other beetles and things like that. Such excitement. It does sound, it's a lot, one of these activities that's a lot better than it sounds. You know, when you plan something, you think this is going to be super, and it actually goes a bit flat. Well, that this is the opposite. It's something that seems very simple um, and goes very, very well, because it connects them with the soil in a really good way. Uh, I would suggest that you look at the equipment list, because they do need one little trial between two, a little children's hand trial. And of course, one of these each. Okay. And today, being COVID aware, I think it'd be best if they did. They're all going to be in the one bubble, of course, but if they did a minimum of sharing 
So if we could have like as many of these and as many um, trials as we can as possible, that would be good. If we can't, of course, then we have to clean handles in between. There is, if you're really interested in this, um, you could also do a soil test or a light test, but I'm recommending the soil survey as the main connection with the soil. If they then switch over, um, you're going to have to buy a set of fossils if you're a year three teacher. There's no way around it, rocks and fossils. And basically, um, I think rocks and fossils, they, they really carry their own, so they do. If they can be in twos and have one each, they can really try to work out what is a rock or a fossil. And if it is a fossil, what is it? Shark's tooth. I've had dinosaur poo before now. Um, rainbow rocks. Local rock would be good, so chalk would be nice, uh, etc. Don't tell them the answers, of course. You, um, being teachers, you would let them work it out. Then at the end, we sh we swap them all over. And oh, how would that work in COVID today? Um, maybe we don't swap as much, but we would certainly hold them up and say what they actually are. Okay. So that's year three rocks, fossils, and soil. Does anybody teach year three here? Robin, do you? No, I'm year four. Year four. Okay. Coming on to year four now. Animals in the environment. So classification is what I've picked for this. Um, not the easiest thing to teach classification, but I have a bit of fun with this at the start. Uh, basically, I, indoors or outdoors, as you, I, as you can appreciate, I'm concentrating on most of the outdoor things, but I'll share this one with you anyway. I would have a bag of lots of cuddly toys and I would try to have one each. They could even bring them in, um, but one each, because they, they don't have to know what they're going, going to be learning yet. Then I would then ask them to get into groups, to, to get into classification groups that they think make sense. Now, that will start lots of conversation because they probably won't get it 100% right, especially if you have a, something I haven't actually used here, a little bat. So the bat always gets a little bit of uh, interest. <laughs> it seems ironic using cuddly toys when you've got the great outdoors, but <laughs> you're not going to be able to hold these things in the outdoors. And um, of course, the RSPB, they do lots of really good, um, well, mostly birds. I would try and get a range. So they won't maybe have brought spiders in and things like that, and maybe a bee, because they're probably more likely to bring hedgehogs and things like that. I would just try to get a range. <laughs> etc okay so that will start a lot of discussions on the definition of a mammal a bird a bat especially will throw them it's always a tricky one reptiles etc then what we do when we get into our, our groups of 15 again carousel style group one will do grass sweeping um, to catch insects now, grass sweeping basically will mean they're catching adults mostly. So we will need a net. The same little jar again. I can tell you I'm going to get really untidy by the end of this. Sorry, they'll need a um, grass sweeping net, um, a jar, and a guide, preferably a field studies guide. Okay. Okay. Um, identification of them is probably secondary to looks at, looking at the taxonomic differences, like how many legs do they have? Do they, does it have wings? Um, it probably won't catch any butterflies. Um, uh, yeah, looking at it, but they'll be so excited. I'm sure if you've done this before with them, um, the excitement's incredible. But I would try to hold it to try to identify how many body segments. Uh, the difference between a spider and an insect, etc., a beetle, that sort of thing. The other group, they will be looking at local flowers. So as they're year four, and not year two, because <laughs> actually year two do something very similar. I'll talk about that when we come on to. As they're year four, I would introduce the botanical art to them. The fact that botanical artists were scientific artists they produced beautiful portraits, but, but they also did it, every single detail was recorded, okay? And 
So when they're drawing outside with their pencils, I would really encourage them to show great detail. You can decide then later on whether to do watercolor or whether just to identify the particular flower. Of course, if you've done your scope, you will know what to expect and lead them towards it. Um, yeah, we'll talk about very briefly at the end, risk assessments and scopes. And so that's the two activities. That's, that's a way of understanding some sort of putting things into different groups um, in terms of plants and flowers, uh, looking at the detail of both, okay? The next thing we're going on to will be life cycles. I feel I could actually help demonstrate this with you if I'm given a chance, but we'll go through it anyway in theory, first of all, life cycles. Okay, this is year five. I start this one off with more cuddly toys, this time the hungry caterpillar. Yeah, a bit, it's a bit young for year fives, but the, the difference is they've got the egg right through the, the larva, the caterpillar right through to the butterfly and labels. They'll have labels, which they'll not have so much in the hungry caterpillar story, which of course is the names of the different processes and I narrow to them. That just gets them talking about the life cycle of a butterfly, um, getting them in the right order. The carousel for this would be, this is a wee bit specialized as it's pond dipping. Now, some schools have ponds, some don't. I would encourage you maybe to go on to one of the video courses, the training courses and look at pond dipping if that would be something that your school would be interested in doing, because having a pond is, is wonderful for, well, basically fishing for little juveniles and of um, dragonflies, caddisflies, damselflies. Let's have a look. Scorpion beetles, etc. I think I've got one there. That's a scorpion beetle. I mean, it's it's a mock beetle. It, it, sorry, it's a mock scorpion, um, but it looks spectacular. Um, yeah. So um, I would encourage the pond dipping for the life cycles. The other one then is a bit more passive, a bit more reflective, and that's in the woodlands. If you've got any oak trees around you, um, horse chestnut would be good too. Uh, I would look at from the acorn saplings through the seeds to the mature tree. Okay. A good practical at the end of this then would be to plant acorns um, with a little hand trial again. Um, it sounds a bit of a strange thing to do, planting wild things. Again, it's getting them engaged and looking after it and taking an interest in it. Um, yeah, so any questions at all? Not Just, from me. Not from you, all quite simple stuff so far. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah, so again, the difference, they would look at the progression, um, the succession from acorn right through to the mature tree. I've got it, is it this one? Hold on, there's a couple of songs. Um, I think that's for year one, you'll keep it for later. Okay, I'm not gonna sing, don't worry. But there are a couple of songs that are really, really good, which I can give you copies of. Um, by the way, I, I will have lesson plans and lists for all of this. We're about halfway now, I think, year six. This is a bit, this isn't heavy, this is a bit more lighthearted. They could, of course, revise if it's presats. Um, they could revise any of the last three lessons, looking at habitats and species, particularly grasslands, woodlands, and water. But I think it's quite good if they go out and relax a little bit and do team building. So this is a forest school one. It's more on mythology. Um, this will sound a bit strange, but have you got forest school background, either of you? Um, I can't. <laughs> Same, aren't we? <laughs> Sorry? We both like. <laughs> you go. I was just going to say I've helped in forest school and things but I haven't done any official training okay well anyway it starts off like this when you're out doing your scope early in the morning best part of the day um, it'll probably be in the school grounds hopefully uh, but basically if, if you've got a wooded area 
I would just tie lots of uh, lots of ribbon, lots of colorful wool, and then as you're on your way to the activity, they'll all be chatting away year six is like anything, glad to be out, getting a break from sat, and then just say, could you help me with this strange phenomena? Um, and there'll be all sorts of weird things like somebody must have come here during the night and tied this up. And the, it's a classic for a screws one. At the end of it, you just say it's evidence of a dragon sneezing and leave it there. That introduces the topic of mythology because when you go into the, the woods, you are going to be looking for, you're going to be asking them to work in teams of four or five and you're going to be asking them to make, make shelters for little people. Uh, if you want to call them borrowers or fairies, whatever you like. Check that they do believe in them. You know, it's keeping the mythology going. This they really love because they're actually um, working together in a team. Now, some teams work together well and others don't. But they have to look at if you were going to survive the night in the forest as a, as a little creature, um, and then it links with a little mammal, what are you going to need? Shelter, drinks, food. Do they need recreation? Well, let them decide that. Certainly won't have mobile phones. Um, but then you give them a piece of string each for building a little rope ladder or um, what else? Yeah, trapeze, something like that. And at the end of it, you celebrate, you take a photograph of what they've created. They're given about 20 minutes, half an hour, and, and you celebrate what they have produced. And um, you come around each and they will talk energetically about their particular, um, their particular little... Um, you know, the comfort place they've made. At the end of it, you say, well, that, you have to think a little bit about what mammals might need if they were surviving in the forest. An alternative to this is to do a shelter for adults um, if they were going to survive the night in the forest. Uh, it's a bit more work. You've got a lot more resources to provide. I wouldn't use plastic. I would just use what's in the wood. Um, and then try, you could ask one of them to go in the shelter and pour a um, watering can over them and see if they can survive that. So that's more of a light-hearted one. Um, at the end, I would, if it's post sats, I would then take them, um, have a, a fire. Again, you need a forest school fire, and I would uh, do organic popcorn, talking about where does popcorn come from, explain the corn in the cob. Um, yeah, pop, pop the corn in front of them. As a forest school leader, you're probably a bit specialized for that. You'd have to invite somebody in, somebody like me or somebody else. Um, but basically, then you'd say, what have you enjoyed about your outdoor education over the, the years? And what are you going to take with you into secondary school? OK, so that is um, slightly different. You can use it for revision. In my experience, they're so stressed out at year six, they just love the team building exercise. Any questions on that, or should we go into key stage one? You okay, Robin? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Stick with it. Key stage one. Year two. Uh, it's Rebecca. Yeah. Now the living and non-living things. This this sounds a bit weird, but I would also start with a mystery. I would have sh I would obtain a skeleton. Yeah, not human, obviously, but a sheep skeleton online. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do sell them. And don't ask me how, but I came across one whenever I was working in West London. And we went into the country park with this thing planted. Even, you know, it's a good lesson when the TAs and the teachers go, oh, my goodness, how did it get there? You know, they actually believe it. I'm sort of going, shh, just let the children answer, you know. So basically, uh, it's a mystery. How did it get there? And they just talk about, is it living, is it dead? The lesson is living and non-living things or things that used to be living as in dead. And that, yeah, it's a bit gruesome, but children love it, okay? So you can get them online, believe it or not. It's all legit. Um, uh, get a sheep or a goat skeleton. The year two, I would say, is exactly the same as the carousel we did earlier with year four, which is... Robin's group, which is basically at a key stage one level, um, catch the grassland species, maybe not be so bothered about the taxonomy of it, just enjoy them because they're doing living things. These are living things. 
and their their adult insects and also sketch the sketch a plant and they're also living things rather than to go into too much about the botanical artist side of it you've got two lessons there which is pretty similar in year four and year two finally year one plants animals and the environment um yeah basically with this one it is quite i start off with a hedgehog puppet just talking about some of the difficulties that hedgehogs have uh, children are really identify and get emotionally involved with that then we are basically again looking for insects only this time i would put a sheet out under a tree branch give it a good shake anything that falls into it and tries to scurry away they'll very quickly catch up in this and you can talk about it that's the animal side of it the tree side is bark rubbing rub, rubbing the bark of the trees and um, there's two songs one is i like the flowers which i sing at this stage you heard of it it's a german song i like the flowers it's a beautiful song around the campfire. I like the flowers. I like the rolling hills. I like the mountains. I like the fireside when the light is low. Boom, de da boom, de da boom. Like that. Or there's the rattling bog. Now, the rattling bog, the vocabulary is about trees. I've got the music for both of those, which I can provide to you in the resources if I give you a pack of that afterwards. Um, the rattling bog does takes it all the way from the twig right through to the trunk of the tree and it names them all so although it's quite a difficult song for adults to sing especially in the woods it actually is a really good one for children to get the vocabulary of trunk branch twig leaf nest bird egg that sort of thing um, and they love singing that i would then finish with a practical uh, planting a hedgerow to support hedgehogs or cutting gaps in this with the with the site manager and the leadership's approval cutting little gaps so that hedgehogs have hedgehogs have access to hedgerows and green places around the school i imagine most of you your, your schools are have they got quite good grounds yeah 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 ours does good good the final thing is the bear hunt for reception. Now, when I started this, some of the preparation for this is, is pretty simple. The year six, they walk out. If they've done the scoop in the morning, which is important, a recce in the morning, they walk out with um, a ball of string and a pair of scissors. And they cut it and give it to the children if they've set up the, the dragon area. Um, Whereas the bear hunt, I'm afraid, is a lot of preparation. You really need to get out for a couple of hours. You ha might have to cut back some of the grass. You know, have to cut away through brambles or nettles so that they can have... Do you know the bear hunt? Yeah. You know the poem? Okay, so basically you have to have um, a grassy area that they go through and touch the grass. You have to have the, the water, mud... You have to have the woods. The hardest one is the snowstorm. I would say for that, um, you have to improvise. Obviously, snowstorms are not something we have very often. Um, and then you have to have a cave for the bear. That all has to be prepared. Uh, but I think it's worth it because it's it's out, outward bounds for, for really little children. It's the first, for some, it'll be the first time being exposed in a sensory way to all of those things. Um, and that's basically it. Is there any questions on that? Anything that I've maybe gone through? I guess the bear hunt, I mean, really, it's probably best if somebody helps to set that up. I've set it up in the school orchard before, never in just the school grounds, though. I do think you need a few trees and a bit of an undulating area where it's exciting to go through. I've set it up in an adjacent country park. Um, and that's the best. So it, that is something that takes even sometimes I would go in the weekend rather than then start cutting in the morning. Nothing worse than getting up early in the morning before school and, and making, you know, going out with the secateurs or the, uh, the loppers 
I'd rather do that the day before or the weekend before. So uh, other than the bear hunt, most of it is a little bit of planning, but not too much. Is there anything you want to ask questions on before just touching risk assessment and COVID? Not for me. We're both year four. Have you got any other top, top tips for year four subjects? Year four subjects. What sort of, um, what, well, I, I well, did you classification. Did. What other subjects are you doing? Not electricity, please. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, not electricity. Uh, animals and their habitats. Sorry? Animals and their habitats. I think yes. is what I'm doing. But just if you've got anything off the top of your head, don't worry if you don't, just for any of the yes. year four specific. I think I have indicated the grasslands. It's pretty good to do the um, grass sweeping for sure, the gra for the grasslands. Have you got, what sort of habitats have you around you, you see? Do you have any wetlands? Have you got woodlands? Woodlands, yes, no wetlands. Woodlands, yeah. Um, I think with woodlands, it all it all depends really. I think um, I mean the most exciting woodlands ones I've had are when somebody said you need somebody with a bit of ecology. I don't know what your specialisms are, but somebody with a bit of ecology to set up uh, a longworth trap <laughs> in the woods uh, to catch a, a wood mouse. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's worth worth getting those skills yourself, but you do have to set set them up very early with some food in the morning, and you have to be confident that if you know if you do catch a, a mouse or a shrew, if it's a weasel, you'd be very lucky. But let it go. It'd be incredibly exciting, but it's not something I've experienced. It's usually a wood mouse. And then you have to be okay to turn it upside down and drop it into a big, heavy plastic bag. And the first thing the children will see is, oh, wow. And they want to see a picture of it to see if it actually looks like it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, if I have, if I can think of anything else, I'll, I'll yes, let you know. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> sorry? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry, it was just if you no, had that, anything. That's, a bit ex that's probably a wee bit of uh, specialist area. But the areas that I was working in were wetlands, pond dipping, um, grasslands, and um, woodlands as well. Um, think uh, when you say you've got woodlands, have you got a few, how many trees? I mean, is it big? Well, the commons just behind us. So yeah, there's, it, right. yeah. But then again, another, the another good forest hope. school starter is um, to meet a tree where you actually buy it. Again, they have to really trust the person. You say year four, year four would be brilliant for this. Yeah, one of them is the guide and the other is the blind person. And you you blindfold them and you say, today we're going to meet a tree. Um, it's one of my favorite trees and you have to really trust the person that they won't take them over curbs or tree roots more like, but they'll actually be their eyes. They lead them by the arm and they say, this is my tree. They're blind, the other person blindfolded touch it and they get really tactile with it and then they take them back to where they started they spin them around a few times and then they say can you find the tree again that's a classic uh, it's more of a starter but it could it's, it's a game basically it could go on quite a long time because they love it okay thank you so as regards risk assessment um I've got basic a, a general risk assessment. I'm not going to go on for half an hour in risk assessment <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, I've got a general generic risk assessment that covers everything like no running, no sprinting on grass, you know, that sort of thing. And then I've got another one which is very specific to that day when you walk out that morning and you find there's been a, a gale overnight and actually you have to check out, mm -hmm. oh, let's not go anywhere near that tree because it's got big overhanging branches and it might be dangerous. So then you just make it, you, you would put an amber in that, or in that case, maybe a red, and you just say, I'll tell the children to avoid the tree. We'll put a marker there, a piece of bamboo and a, a ribbon on it, and then it becomes green. It's okay to go ahead. So the, the most useful of the risk assessments, because let's face it, the generic ones, how many people read them? We have to have them in place, but the, the local one 
the, the daily one on an Excel spreadsheet is the one that I use from day to day. COVID guidelines, you're probably COVID, COVIDed out at the moment, are you? There's no point in going over yeah. your, are you? How's it going from that front? Yeah, it's not very easy. Do you wear shield at all or? No, no shield. Lots of hand washing. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, the thing is, I'm not going to give recommended websites on guidance for staff, full reopening, all that sort of thing. All I will say is that outdoors is healthier because of its fresh air. Um, but we should still, when we're using different equipment, swapping it over, I think we would have to be aware that it's just like pencils and Sharpies indoors, whatever you use. Um, you don't share them as much as possible. But if you do share them, then you have to sort of gel our hands and and clean the, sh the shafts and all that. So, so that's it, really, whistle stop. I don't know how useful that's been. If you want to give me some feedback at the end, there is a form on, um, I can either send you, or if you go onto my website, there's a feedback button, which you have to download, I'm afraid, and then attach it and all that, or even just drop me an email, what, what is useful, you know. Or is this all old hat? You've done it all at teacher training college, in which case I'd be delighted, but I doubt it. No, we have <laughs> it's, um, There's been some really good, useful um, activities, actually, that I'd really like to do with my class. Thank you. Okay. I agree. Um, Thank you. I will be in touch. Sorry, Rebecca. I agree. Thank you. You're really helpful. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's been a little bit one-to-one, -one, actually. Yeah, one-to-one -one tuition. <laughs> um, complaining. <laughs> with two gifted people, um, but I would say um, I will be in touch about if I can support any more, because the other people have all asked about a follow-up. Um, basically, there, there is an opportunity. Um, we're not meant to do a hard sales pitch in this. Of course, we're not, but this has all been recorded. So I'll just be up front and say there is a great lot of COVID-19 funding through the South Downs National Park to get this up and running. Um, particularly in the winter. Now, what I would say with the winter is it's not the ideal time. I find that schools only start to buzz about Easter, but I would say use that time to do training, um, to have a model lesson with a class, something that maybe one of your colleagues would like to see done. Say, so how do you do the bear hunt outside? That is a big challenge, but I can do it. And um, then for them to pick up with the lesson plan and the, the list of equipment, to run with come the nice spring and summer because that will not be sponsored by South Downs so much unless uh, the policy changes. At the moment, it's very much until March the 31st, 2021. So I will type this all up to you uh, as a sort of, when I send you across lesson plans, do you, do you want lesson plans for this? Lesson yes, plans yes. and a list yes. of equipment because I realize it has been really, really just skimming through it, you know. Uh, and I'll explain to you then. All Thank right, you. if there's no further questions,